Echo Oregon Madison Farms following the process of how to make biodiesel. And today I will be talking with Kent Madison, owner and operator of Madison Farms. Welcome, Katie. Well, thank you. How are you doing today? Very good, thank you. Very good. So today we're going to be looking at the process of how to make biodiesel from start to finish. That's correct. We'll show you the harvesting of canola, the storage, and the crushing in the biodiesel process. We raise uh, canola for our own biodiesel production and to supply oil to sequential uh, in Salem and to supply the oils to the city of Portland or the fuels to the city of Portland. Canola is actually rape seed. Rape seed is a, a plant that has been around for centuries. It was one of the major oil sources during the Industrial Revolution for lub lubricating oils. But rape seed is real high in perisic acid and so it's unfit for human consumption. And then the Canadian government in the 70s and 80s went through a plant breeding program where they started breeding the perisic acid out of rapeseed and created what we know today as canola, which is really Canadian oil. This seeds anywhere from 30 to 45 percent oil content. It, it is the most efficient resource for biofuel in the state of Oregon um, because it's a plant that can, that can be raised on a lot of acres. Uh, a lot of marginal acres and still produce an oil resource. It's a pretty high yielding oil resource. In our case, canola is a great rotational crop because it uses little water and it uses water at a different time of the year. And we're so short of water that it's a, a problem to, the, that we need to have a crop that uses a little wa water. And canola fits into our rotation. Bit. So we'll probably run between 600 to 1,000 acres of canola every year just because of its rotational characteristics. Where do you get your canola from? Uh, we get the canola from a company called Wilbur Ellis. Uh, they get it from Monsanto uh, and Decal, the major seed producers of the nation, really. Are you able to keep the seed from the canola plants and replant that seed the next year? Now, these are proprietary varieties, and so you technically couldn't keep them. They're not public varieties. In the case of a GMO, the farmer never owns that seed. He is only allowed to grow it and sell it. At any time, the company that sold the farmer that GMO seed can come and claim its seed and claim its crop if they decide they do not want it to be sold. GMOs cannot adapt to organic agriculture because they are legally prohibited from doing so. I believe that genetically modified crops properly managed, um, and that's the key word, is properly managed, is actually better for the environment than non-genetically modified crops because we can raise a commodity that produces more per acre, canola like we raise, which is what the only genetic modification to it is the Roundup Ready gene alter, alterization of it. So we can then take this canola, plant it, spray it with Roundup herbicide, which is a, a very benign herbicide that kills anything it touches, but once it hits the dirt, it becomes inert and there's no residual to it. So it's real safe on the environment from that standpoint. And those herbicides we wouldn't, that we would use otherwise do have long-term uh, residual effects in the soil, which limit our cropping rotation in the next go-around if we use a particular uh, herbicide to control weeds in one of our uh, crops, then we may not be able to use a different crop the next year because of that problem. If society came to me and says, you know, we don't want to buy your GMO oil for even our biodiesel, I'd say that's not a problem at all as long as you're willing to pay more for it. Uh, with the upsurge of interest in biofuels, um, we have seen the Willamette Valley's seed production uh, potential actually threatened by the idea of growing canola for oil seed here in the Willamette Valley. For specialty seed growers here in the valley, that would be an unmitigated disaster because canola, wherever it is grown as an oilseed crop, becomes established as a roadside weed. This has happened everywhere it's been grown. Canola cross-pollinates with many of the plant varieties that are grown here in the valley. We have absolutely no problem with canola production on our farm. Um, it's a brassica, it's a broadleaf plant, so in the rotation, the herbicide practices, the tillage practices that we use in all those different crop rotations, it, it can't compete, it can't become a problem, and it never seems to survive outside the irrigated area in our climate. Of course, we get a, we're in a six to nine inch rainfall area, so not a lot of stuff can survive outside the, outside the irrigated area.
the biodiesel plant takes that stored seed and runs it through the crushers. We squeeze the oil out of the seed. The seed's anywhere from 30 to 45% oil content. And we run it through those crushers, which squeezes the oil out of the seed, um, leaving high-valued canola meal left over for livestock production. And that is really what we would consider in our industry extra virgin canola oil because it's been cold crushed, no heat process associated with it other than the natural heat of the crushers. Uh, then the oil comes out of that, out of the crushers, goes through the centrifuge, which separates the solids from the, the oil. Um, that oil is then stored and sold to sequential or manufactured in the biodiesel in our own facility. But the big bottom line picture is if it's a profitable enter enterprise for us. You know, we're, we're a for-profit entity and proud to be that way. This is April Westfall at the Sequential Pacific Biodiesel Plant in Salem. The truck you see pulling in is delivering the raw canola oil from Madison Farms to be processed into biodiesel. Two years ago, this was the first commercial biodiesel plant in Oregon. It produces one million gallons of biodiesel per year, but that's about to change. In July, singer-songwriter Willie Nelson paid a visit to break ground on a new five million gallon facility to meet the growing demand. Willie is a strong supporter of biodiesel and has his own plant in Texas called Bio Willie. Willie is an investor in the project together with Pacific Biodiesel based in Hawaii. Their business plan calls for small-scale local production and distribution of biodiesel as a way of countering the centralized, more energy-intensive and less efficient, large-scale importers of foreign-produced oil called feedstock. They take pride in the fact that their feedstock comes from central Oregon fields and local waste oil is processed here in Salem and delivered to Oregon consumers. Mike Fitz is the owner of Star Oil Company, and he likes it too, 100% Oregon, he says. After unloading the raw oil into these heated storage tanks, Fitz, as he's known to his friends, loads up with 100% pure biodiesel and heads north to Portland. At Star Oil Company in Northeast Portland, the biodiesel from Sequential is stored and blended for sale to local retailers. Fitz is delivering his load while Mark Fitz, his son, talks to us about the business of bringing biodiesel to market. My dad bought his first one truck heating oil company in 1979 with $30,000 in poker winnings he bought back from Vietnam. And uh, with that grew that and eventually merged with Star Oil and took over the general management and grew it to where we're at. Our first experiences with uh, alternative energy back in the early 80s was with uh, um, alcohol fuels um, because gasoline was rationed and hard to get. And of course he was very familiar with that as well as solar power, which we took a, an attempt at in the early 80s as well as maybe an alternative to actual natural gas and oil heat. As we went into the 21st century, it was my hope to actually rekindle that. And I knew that with uh, climate change and global warming being a head concern for a lot of people, there was a renewed interest beyond price. There was a real value concern in having something beyond a petroleum fuel. You know, um, probably the, the biggest breakthrough we've seen, the, the, most, you know, the most excited embracing of biodiesel are heating oil customers who have been seeing increasing costs rising through the roof. I mean, we really, you know, it's, it's really hard to talk to somebody who's in retirement who's seen the cost of their, their heating oil, you know, double or triple in the span of two years. Uh, and a lot of these people see biodiesel as something they can do to actually offset that. Uh, even though, for the most part, biodiesel is a little bit more expensive, they still embrace it and are excited about an American-made fuel that, that they really could see a future of the price coming down. There are probably some hurdles that you had to overcome to get to where you are now. The biggest one was the idea that it definitely wouldn't work because we'd tried it before in the early 80s here in this country. Um, the big argument was you'll work really hard, you'll build this market. Once you build the market, then the big guys will enter, take it away from you by price dumping, and then once the interest is gone, they'll recede and it will disappear. Right off the bat, myself as well as sequential biofuels saw that we needed to focus on building something beyond just a price market, that our product and, and Sequential's brand had to represent something other than just this fuel at this price. So there's a whole host of business model concepts that, that Sequential has put together and, and worked with its distribution network. Um, quality assurance programs, 
sourcing of where the feedstock's coming from as well as building relationships to make sure that as they grow, it comes from Oregon farmers and, and regional producers of crops. And we'll have quite a few retail locations in the area. In fact, Portland's the largest retail market for B99 in the United States. No kidding. No kidding. So tell me a little bit about the future. What do you envision with biofuels? We're making very strong efforts to actually begin to segment our product to where we have what we call an Oregon Fair Trade product, to where you can track that it came from Oregon, it came from farmers who grew it in certain practices, you know, and therefore it's a higher value, you know, you know, product that someone who wants to buy that would be able to see it at the pump. Beyond that, the hope would be to go to organic as well, because you have many farms that will be growing canola in rotation that are already certified organic. They can't switch. So therefore, you know, you should be able to pay them for their, their, for their actual diligence and, and, and differentiate that product based on that. I'm willing to pay more because I want to be part of the solution and not the, pro not the problem, as much as I can be. That's right. Which isn't 100%, but I'm, I'm trying to do, do your part. Do my part, and especially for my students, and to kind of walk my talk a little bit. I think it's, it's a piece of the puzzle. It's by no means going to solve all of our problems, but mm -hmm. I think it's um, certainly, agriculturally speaking, I think it'll work. It works really well on farms. We use it because it's, I feel like it's a, you know, it's a good idea to support anything that's, that's not. It's, it's uh, more of a renewable What What does Papa make at Christian's house? Biodiesel. That's right. I'm April Westfall with Sustainable Today, bringing you the tools to be more sustainable today.